Good morning. My name is Robert McGee. I work at SideFX Software. And I'm here today to talk to you about uh, particles and dynamics uh, as a sort of Houdini foundation. Uh, how many people out there are using Houdini today? Uh, great. Uh, well, this is, this is meant to be a little bit from the ground up, so I was, if you don't know Houdini at all, this is sort of targeted to you, but I think there's always room to uh, learn the fundamentals, uh, even if you've tinkered with it for a while. So, uh, I don't know whether many of you know, but we have a book up on the website called Houdini Foundations. Uh, this is a book we published a few months ago, uh, and it's in PDF format on the website, and it's also, you can get a print-on-demand version uh, if you'd like to have an old-fashioned printed copy. Now this book is filled with a bunch of different chapters. It has an overview chapter at the beginning which has about a hundred pages of just going through different parts of the software like the workspace and the transformations and parameters and attributes and what are all these things and how do they fit into the world. So if you want to get a good sense of the terminology of Houdini and how that terminology uh, can be applied to the work that you're doing, uh, it's a great introduction. Uh, we also have some tutorials, so we have one on modeling, animating, and rendering a soccer ball. Uh, and this just helps you, introduce you to what nodes, networks, uh, you know, what the geometry context is, what the modeling concept, and all this stuff is. Uh, we then have another one, which is procedural game assets for UE4. This came out a little bit around GDC time, so we had a little bit of a games focus on some of this stuff. And then we have a chapter on train generation. Now the goal is to continue to expand this book and to add chapters and to a large degree my presentation today is a preview for a chapter I'm working on on particles and dynamics which will end up in this book, uh, but you're the guinea pigs. So let's step back and just talk about Houdini in general. Uh, for those of you who don't know what it is or haven't worked with it, uh, Houdini uh, is a package that can do a whole bunch of different things. It does the full gamut of what you'd want to do in a CG pipeline, modeling, rendering, uh, character effects, rigging, animation, particles, and dynamics. Now all of this is done a special way because Houdini is procedural. From the ground up, it does things in a procedural way. And what that means is we're using nodes. Everything you do in Houdini creates a node, and those nodes connect together to make networks, and those networks define the flow of data within Houdini. And this gives you a lot of power. It gives you the ability to go in and make changes, to explore multiple iterations as you're working, but it also allows you to package up what you're doing and share it with someone else, uh, or build a little mini pipeline in a box out of what Houdini has to offer. And of course, the big studios, it's, it's a big box. So these nodes, come in a bunch of different flavors. Uh, because we use them for modeling and for dynamics and so on, all those different parts of Houdini function a little bit differently. So we have specific nodes for those areas. Uh, for instance, surface nodes define work with geometry. Uh, channel nodes define motion. Uh, dynamic nodes for simulation. Vex we use for shader building and for other manipulation of, of, of things. Uh, compositing for images and render outputs. We even have out, uh, nodes for wiring together outputs. Now, if you're going to get into Houdini, one of the things you're going to have to get used to is there is sort of a secret language that comes out of this. Because when we first created these nodes, we called them operators. So that led to this language where surface operators were known as SOPs. Channel operators, CHOPs, dynamics, DOPs, etc. And this sort of secret language uh, you will encounter if you're out doing tutorial videos or you're talking to colleagues at work. They'll be saying, well, we're in the chop net and we're, we're talking about DOPS and we're going to move it over into SOPS. And, and at first, this can be a little intimidating. So it is worth your while to, to get a little comfortable with this language. And in the foundation guide, we do have a section where we sort of do the translation for you. Uh, but that is a very important part of, of moving forward with Houdini. The interface itself actually doesn't try to reveal those, those things anymore. It, they call it the surface nodes and the, the, like it's, it's a little easier to work with, uh, but when you start working with other artists, many of them are going to come with this, this secret language in their vocabulary, so good to get used to it. So today, because we're doing particles and dynamics, we're going to work with DOPS. Now there used to be a section called POPS for particles, uh, but we got rid of that and actually incorporated the particles into DOPS just so that they can work in a more unified environment. Um, so there is no POPS anymore. Uh, and then SOPS. 
Now, SOPS is for geometry, but often when you're doing dynamics, you're starting with geometry, sending the stuff over to be simulated, and then you want to get the result back. So we're going to show, I'll show you later how those, these two guys sort of talk to each other and, and how they work together, and that's sort of an important aspect of visual effects. Because a lot of people think it's all simulation, but in Houdini, a lot of the work is done in, in the geometry context for setting up uh, normals on a surface to spit out fluids in a, in a, in a proper way, uh, or set up your particles, and we're going we're gonna to look at a couple examples of that. Now, in the dynamic environment, there's a whole bunch of different solvers. Uh, we have solvers for particles, rigid bodies, that's a bullet solver, Pyrofex, flip fluids, grains, which is sand and, and snow, uh, FEM, wires, cloth, crowds. Uh, we're going to focus mostly in today on particles, rigid bodies, and Pyrofex, um, but it is good to know that the concepts and ideas that we're going to talk about here, if you were to go off and do flip fluids, it's a, just a variation of that. So the dynamics environment is a sort of a unified place for that stuff to work. So let's just take a quick preview of some of the solvers and sort of where you can go with it. Um, here we have some examples uh, that I got from Rebelway. Uh, this is a company that does some online training. Um, you can pay for one of their courses, join in, and it takes you pretty deep into some really nice examples. So uh, they, they offered me some, some video to show you. So this is some particle stuff. Uh, this is fluids, uh, which is uh, flip fluids, and then you've got the white water, which is sort of particle based. Uh, here we have some destruction, which is probably a combination of rigid body and a little bit of FEM. Uh, so that's there. Uh, here's some destruction where you've got particles and, and smoke coming out of, uh, out of, a, sim, out of a, uh, a rigid body destruction. And what's neat here is it's, it, you're able to get those particles coming right off of the cracks and the seams. And that's where Houdini's procedural nature works because you can find those cracks and seams and then spit out the, uh, the dust and debris from there. And here we have a nice uh, pyro sim with a robot coming into it there. So these guys, uh, if you, you know, definitely want to take your skills to the next level, these are uh, a great uh, people to go talk to. And at the end, I'll talk about some other options for learning uh, as you go forward. Uh, now, here's an example of uh, if you happen to do game stuff uh, and you want to get your visual effects and dynamics into there, uh, because of the way the game engines work, generally speaking, you can't just bring the volumes and the particles and everything over. Uh, you need to translate it in some way. So here we have a tool in Houdini put together our, by our game development uh, team where you take this, this fireball and you generate a, a texture sheet out of it. And that texture sheet uh, can then be brought into uh, a game engine such as Unity or Unreal and then used to put that into your game. So, you know, normally you're just rendering it for film or TV, uh, but in this case you're going to render it to one of these texture sheets and bring it over. And we have a, a team of TDs focused on game development tools uh, that support the different workflows that game artists need, uh, although a lot of film people have actually uh, clicked into some of these tools and used them for other things as well. So here we in just bring a, a a grid in and we're just going to assign the uh, texture sheet and a ramp onto there uh, and then take that and put that onto the grid and there we go we get our our fireball and then we just can play with some of the colors and because of that we can get it look sort of fireball so that's that's an example of of how you'd bring that into that world so a lot of visual effects have the possibility and if you're doing something like a destruction shot we have a tool for exporting the destruction as a series of objects attached to bones so you can get that there as well so let's get started let's look at a simple example of, of that will allow us to look at the dot nodes in a very fundamental way and figure out how they work and how they communicate with each other so here we have an example of a soccer ball like i said we build the soccer ball in one of the uh, tutorials in the foundations book so I've got this, and all I want to do is I want to raise that up from the ground, and I want to drop it uh, and do a simulation from there. So this will allow us to see the different parts that are involved. So the first thing we do is we're going to go over and create a uh, rigid object, rigid body object. And this creates a new network you can see in the network called the auto-dop network. And in here is the beginnings of our, of our dynamics network. And it already has gravity applied in it, so you've got a rigid object feeding down through gravity. There's a couple merge nodes that, in case we do other stuff, they'll feed in. Uh, 
one of the things we'd like to do is we want it to collide with something, so let's put a ground surface down. And as we put this down, now you notice the shelf tool um, will often put nodes all over the place, and that's one of the advantages, especially for dynamics of working with the shelf tools, is they'll build some of these networks for you, which gives you a better opportunity to understand how they work. Uh, it's possible to build these things from scratch, but you're going to learn a lot more if you're starting with the shelf. So now we've got the, the two sides of the network, one feeding into the rigid body solver, which is the ball, and then we've got the, the um, ground plane feeding through a static solver. So the ground plane's not going to be affected by anything that's happening, but it's there to, to provide a collision uh, surface. So now we're going to go in and we're going to add some initial velocity, because so far the dynamics of the ball is not that exciting. Uh, and we can set the direction and so on that we want there. Let's go in the negative direction, and we'll get that uh, moving op off in the opposite direction. Now, so far, we've created something that we probably could have keyframed. And um, so it's like, what's the point of the simulation? But it's not going to take long before we can introduce, let's say, a few more soccer balls, and then simulation will clearly become the better solution. Uh, and the difference between keyframing and simulation is in keyframing, you're going to figure out every hit point and exactly how it works, whereas in the case of simulation, you're setting up the forces, and then you're just playing it and see what happens. And because of that, sometimes you get these nice accidents. You didn't expect that to happen, or that wasn't what you expected, but that, that really works. Now, you can always keep track of your parameters. So if you go back to a very specific set of parameters, you will always get the same result, uh, but you can type in different parameters if you want a different result. So now we've added in this wall just to cre create another static element within our network. Uh, and there you can see um, them working. And now we can go in and um, let's just raise that up so it's shooting up a little bit. And then we'll, uh, we'll do a little bit more. And you can see the network has all the components um, that we would need. So it's not overly complicated here. The, let me just, uh, okay, we're playing that again. Okay, so now we look at the network and we can see the different components that go into it. So we have, uh, over in this area, we have our collision objects feeding through a static solver. Uh, over here, we have our rigid body object, essentially our source. If this was a fluid, we would be spitting the fluids out of that source, but in this case, the source is the actual geometry. We have our gravity as our force, and we're going to use other forces later on and they all work together and then send the information back to the geometry object. Now, one of the things we'd like to do is instead of having one soccer ball, we'd like to have more of them. So in, we could just create a bunch of soccer balls and then make them all RBD objects and they'd all feed in. But instead of doing that, we can actually take advantage of the one soccer ball we have here and uh, turn it into sort of a soccer ball cannon. So we're gonna feed in a pop source here and we're, instead of using the RBD object, we're gonna reference that geometry over here on the pop source. So we're going to copy that over there. And then we're going to tell it to use all geometry. And then we're going to set up some of the attributes that we had on the other object, and we're going to put them here instead. So this is a way of, of uh, getting multiple objects instead of just the one. So we can type in the same kind of values that we had before, 5 and negative uh, 15. And there we go. Now we go back to here and under the impulse activation. So this particular parameter says simulate, go do it. So what we're going to do is we're going to put an expression in that says do it, but do it every 10 seconds. Every 10 seconds, activate this thing. So instead of getting one soccer ball, we're going to get one every 10 seconds. And that will give us this sort of cannon, the soccer ball cannon that we, uh, that we want to get a little bit more interesting simulation out of. And there we go. Now, they're all sort of coming out exactly the same, so we can go back to those attributes that we were playing with before, and we can add a little bit more variety and variation into here, maybe make that a little stronger, and um, set up the variance just so maybe we'll get a little more variety in, uh, in where these things are going. And all of these, you know, this is how simulation works. You play with these parameters, and then you go, simulate, see what happens. If you like the result, then you, then you, you go forward with it. And there we go, so now we've got that working. So this is just a simple addition to the, the network we have. Uh, we've just taken that source and made it a little bit more sophisticated than the sort of off-the-shelf experience, and now we've got the soccer balls here. Now, it, 
in this case here, I've only played with the, the, velo the velocity, the initial velocity of this, but there are other parameters both on the colliding objects on, and on the rigid objects that come into play. And some of those are things like friction, uh, bounciness, uh, and other things like that. So we can actually go and play with those parameters uh, if we want to get a different result. And so again, it's just simulation is about tinkering with those, those parameters and what they do uh, to get what you want. So we go into here and we can say, let's look at that original soccer ball, and we can say you can play with its mass, its stiffness, and we're just going to change that to 1.5 or maybe 2. Let's go with 2. And now we go back up here, and now the soccer balls are going to be a little bit more active and, well, maybe a little too active, but uh, there we go. So those are the different components that we have uh, in our simulation there. Now, I talked about geometry network. I haven't shown it yet, but let's go and talk about what's going on at the geometry level versus what's going on under the hood uh, of the dynamics network. So in the case of the geometry network, when we use the shelf tool to make it into an RBD object, it added a rest node, a pack primitive node, and a dop import node. That dop import node was then used to feed, well, originally it was feeding the packed object that we had, and now we're using it to feed the pop source. So in your dynamics network, just like we looked at before, you have your source objects, source object. You have your force, so gravity was what was pulling it down. Uh, we have collision objects, and we have solvers. And these all work together. Now, you might ask a question, well, why is gravity at the bottom? Shouldn't gravity be feeding into the, the solvers? Because otherwise, how is the solver going to know to use gravity? One of the things that's unique about the DOP networks compared to other networks in Houdini is once you start simulating, it's reading up and down the network. So it's, it's looking at the whole picture. So in some cases, it doesn't matter exactly what the order is. The order isn't as important as it might be in the geometry network where everything just flows right through uh, there or a compositing network or something else like that. So there is a little more flexibility there. And then, of course, the output node eventually sends the information back to the geometry network so that you can apply materials, maybe cache it out, do something there. So there's this sort of relationship there. That's why, actually, if you look at the auto dot network when it get, first gets created, it's actually hidden because you don't need to see that at the object level uh, because all the information is being sent back to the geometry object that you have over on the side. Okay. So the tutorial that I'm, plan I'm working on for the next Foundations book is called The Bomb. And it's going to have particles, rigid bodies, and pyro effects in it. And we're going to go through some of the steps that will be in that lesson here today. Uh, it's sort of a neat lesson because, you know, it, you're going to get some introductory particle stuff uh, and um, learn how to work with some different forces. And uh, the pyro effects is probably the one area where it's not as developed right now. Um, I'm hoping to go back home and create something a little bit better than what, what I have here today, but we'll just touch on it quickly just so that you see how it fits into the picture. So the, the different elements we're going to talk about here is the soot trail. So as the fuse goes and animates, uh, it's going to drop particles on the ground to create sort of a soot trail, and that'll be our introduction to particles. Then we're going to talk about how to create these sparks, and that's going to be a little bit more sophisticated because we're going to have two or three different kinds of sparks, and we're going to have them all sort of connected into each other. Uh, then we'll do the RBD shatter for the bomb over here, and then we'll do the fireball at the end. So before we get into that, let's talk about the scene setup. In the tutorial, I'll have you build this from scratch, uh, but for today, I didn't want to take the extra time. So let's just go through the network to see we can see how this is built. So we've got the bomb geometry, uh, we've got the fuse, and we've got a ground surface, which we've made unselectable in the viewport. And we've got some animation on the fuse already set up so that it can you know, wind its way in and blow up the bomb. So the way that we do this is um, the fuse itself is built using a path. So there's a path tool in Houdini which allows you to create a series of CVs in 3D space and position those to get the curve that you want. And all of these together will create a curve geometry and we parented the last CV into the bomb so we could rotate the bomb and it all sort of feeds in properly. Then there's a curve that comes from that, but we're hiding all of that because that's just, we're just going to reference that and we're going to hide that. So once we had that, I created a second object by 
merging, object merging out that path that we had and putting that into this fuse um, geometry object. So if we dive down into there, uh, we can see the network here is starting off with a object merge of this path that was brought in from the path uh, CVs. Then we use something called a carve sop, which has a parameter that we can use to, we can keyframe that uh, first U, and that will create the uh, animation on that path. Uh, we also have a static one with a switch node in case we wanted to turn it off, but uh, for now we're gonna keep that on. Uh, then we did some resampling, some, some subdivision, and then from there, uh, we did a polywire, and polywire adds thickness to the whole thing and adds end caps to it. And then what we did was we isolated the end cap, which was polygon zero, so that was easy to find, and we're gonna use that as our emitter for the particles that we're working on. So the first thing we do is add a cap node on there, which gives it a little bit of three-dimensionality, uh, and then we're gonna create a null object so we can export that out later. Uh, we then also have one that's colored that we, this helps us for visualization purposes here, and as you can see, that animates away. So that shows you the different elements we have in the, in the scene. Now for the geometry uh, of the bomb, uh, we have, let's get zoom in there on that. Uh, we have a network that starts out uh, just as a simple sphere. Uh, we deleted the end, the end geometry there, poly extruded out that edge, and then poly extruded in all the faces to give it a nice thick shell. A uh, couple, couple poly, uh, poly bevels there to, to round that out, and we've got ourselves the bomb geometry. Then we added a Voronoi fracture onto that, and there's a bunch of nodes here for that. And as you can see, uh, that goes in and does that fracture. And we set it up with the number of chunks we wanted. And then we feed that into a switch node. And that switch node is designed to basically, at the point we want the explosion to happen, switch from the original geometry uh, into the uh, simulation geometry. So we'll be working with that as we go along. And then we have a couple cameras. We have this one set up to sort of follow along. Uh, so that was set up in the original shot so we're, we can use that as a reference as we're working. Uh, and then there's another camera that's just a generic one. There we go. Okay. So the ne first thing we're going to do is we're going to create the particles and create the soot trail. And uh, let's dive into that. So. We already learned that we have this uh, animated fuse, and we put this end cap that we're going to use as our emitter for the source of the particles. So we're going to display that end cap here, and we don't want to do it in this network because that's our fuse network. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to do a uh, extract, which is going to object merge, so take that geometry and bring it out uh, into this environment. So we get a whole new object, and we're going to call that uh, end of fuse particles. And you'll see that um, we can go back to the normal fuse here. So there's the fuse, and it's animated. But we also have the little piece that you can barely see there, but it's going to animate along, and we'll be able to work with that. We'll zoom in and, and focus on that in a second. So once we get into here with this, uh, what we're going to want to do is add a particle network, uh, a pop net, but pop net is really a dot net as we talked about earlier. So it's a dynamic network, uh, but we can feed that right into uh, here. So we're not using the auto dot network we used before. We're just building it right here in place. And this gives us a source, uh, which we can set up the number of particles, what's the birth rate, uh, and have that set up uh, to simulate. So if we just press play, you'll see we're coming out. Now, one of the problems is we're not, the particles aren't doing very much. And one of the reasons for this is that the object that we're, we have is not really animated. It's animated at the SOP level, but not at the object level. So there really is no velocity on this thing at all. So what we need to do is trick it into having a bit of velocity. And the way we're gonna do that is we're just gonna use the normals coming out of the sphere, out of that little end cap, and we'll convert that into, um, take the normal and convert it into velocity. So by doing that, we've set a velocity value that we can then use to emit our particles. And if we go back and we play that, uh, you'll see how that works. So now we're emitting particles off of the end cap there. 
Now, there's still some that are not looking fantastic, so just to make it a little bit more interesting, we're going to put in an attribute randomize, and we'll put that on V just to get a, a slightly more interesting result there. So you see how we're using the geometry context to massage the information, the, the attributes that are feeding into that system, uh, and that's helping us get the result that we want. So now we've got the particles, but they're sort of flying all over the place. And what we'd like to do is have them land on the ground, because our purpose was to have it uh, create this trail on the ground. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to take that network, and we're going to select that, and we're going to create a... Oh, first... Oh, I know. They're flying all over the place because we didn't put gravity on them. So we want them to fall down and hit the ground. So first we put gravity in. We got that for free when we did the RBD sim, but we didn't get that for free here. So we add the gravity into the network. And then the next thing we want to do is add in the collision geometry so that it falls and hits the ground. So the way that we're going to do that is, again, just selecting that piece there that we have, our initial particles, and we're going to say, give us the ground plane like this. Now, back at the object level, it creates a ground place plane object that we don't need to see, so we'll just go and hide that. And then if we go back into the, the network, here, uh, we can um, hide it there as well. So press L to look at the whole network, and now we've got a static object with our collision geometry going there, and we don't really need the merge node, uh, and let's turn off the, uh, the display of that in here. So now when we go and play the network, we're going to have our particles falling with gravity, uh, hitting that surface. Now it looks like they're just floating in space, but if you tumble around, you see they're actually on the ground. Now, you might say, well, they're sliding on the ground, but if you look carefully, they're not sliding on the ground, they're just bouncing like this along the ground. Because by default, um, the only kind of collision that particles can do is bouncing. And that's not what we want. We want them to stick to the ground. So if we want more, you see there's an exaggerated bounce. You can see they're definitely bouncing. So we want to have them stick. So instead of using that collision that we have there, we're going to turn that off. And um, we're going to do it a little bit differently. So instead of using a, a collision with a, through a static object, uh, we're going to go in and add a new node called uh, Pop Collision Detect. And this is going to allow us more options uh, for doing the kind of collision that we want with particles. So we put this down. And in this case, uh, we're going to find the ground surface and accept that. And then we're going to go in and take, figure out what the behavior is. So we have a number of options under behavior. And some of those include uh, die, stop, stick, or slide. So we're going to pick stick. So now when the particles come out, they're white particles to come out. And as soon as they hit the ground and stick, they become red particles. And that allows us to see how that works. So this is, as the fuse goes along, this is what's going to happen. And we're going to get these sort of dead particles or, uh, sticking to that surface. And we could also set up another pop um, collision detect so that they would come out and hit the geometry of the, of the bomb itself and sort of slide off of there. Uh, but that's not really necessary uh, for this example. But that is another a way to extend it a little bit further. So now we can go into here, uh, put a nice little sort of dark gray color on that to create the soot. And we've got ourselves uh, first particles. So as you can see, uh, particles work within the dynamics network. They work under the same principle of source object, forces, collisions, really those three things working together. And really, a lot of your work as a, as a visual effects artist, artist is making sure that those things are, that you're sourcing the material in an interesting way, that you're colliding them in an interesting way, and that you've got appropriate forces to make things interesting. So there we go. Now, the next thing we're going to work on is the particle sparks. So this is going to get a little more interesting in terms of what you can do with particles. And it's going to show you, again, a little bit more interaction between what goes on in the particle or dynamic world versus what we're going to do at the geometry level, because we're going to build part of the sparks um, out here. So we have this existing network of the soot. And to save time, we're just going to alt, click, and drag and use that as the starting point for our spark. So we don't have to do all that work twice. A lot of that work we're going to get for free. Make that copy. We're going to call this um, end diffuse sparks. And let's go and hide the other one, because we don't need that one right now. We're going to come into here. And this is all going to stay the same, although we're going to bypass the color for now. And we're going to get rid of that pop um, 
detect thing because we don't want these particles to stick to the ground. So we're back to them just falling into nothingness at the moment. But these ones aren't going to last as long. Because they're sparks, we're just going to have them die pretty quickly. So we're going to go into the original source, and we can go in and just change the uh, life expectancy and the life variance to very, very small numbers. These, these are based on time, not frames, so it's 0 0.0575 of a, of, a, of a second, which is at 30 frames a second. We're then going to uh, add to the initial velocity, and there we go. We now have little, little sparkles coming out of the end there uh, that will be very good for us to do, to do these sparks. But we don't want little points. We want lines. Um, so we need to uh, sort of enhance this a little bit, and we're going to enhance it by, by, adding a, by replicating these particles to create new particles and then ultimately connecting those together um, at the geometry level. Now, before we do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a pop color node down because as we go, we're going to branch this off into two different particle networks that work together and come back. So we're going to use the color to help differentiate them. It's a good way to debugging things as you're working. So we're going to make the initial particles all yellow, uh, and then we're going to put down a pop replicate node. Now, this is going to create the trail, the particle trail that we're going to use to connect all of this together. So these are the trail sparks. And in this case, we have to, we, we, these particles, we don't want them flying all over the place. We want them to basically just come out and just, just hang there and do their job. So we're going to turn off activation, birth rate. Uh, we're going to give them exactly the same life expectancy and variance as the original ones that they're copying. Uh, and then we're going to um, change the shape to point. And their attributes, we want to set the velocity, but we want it to be zero, 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 because they're just come out, do their thing, and then disappear. So at first we got this, great, uh, there's a few more particles but they aren't really looking like sparks yet. So to do that we want to go back up to the geometry level where we can take the information we've created down here at the dot level and we're going to uh, use that and we're going to use something called an add SOP. And the odd SOP will allow us to um, by group uh, bring this together and well that's not exactly what we want but it's a starting point. Uh, the problem is that we don't want all of these particles connected as one big group. We want to have a very specific group. So what we're going to do is we're going to add in a wrangle node here to connect the particle ID to its parent ID. So as you replicate a particle, there's a parent and there's a particle, and we want them both to have the same number. Um, so this little script is going to make sure that the parent and the child all have the same number, which is going to help us later when we try to connect these together. So the little expression we have is to take the integer of the parent ID and they make that equal to the ID of the particle itself. And we're going to press enter and it's an error because I think I left a space there. We got to get rid of that space. And there we go. So once we've got that, we can go back up to this level and instead of when we say by group, we can say by attribute and we can put parent ID, a parent ID. Now once we have that, it doesn't do anything quite yet, but if we go back to frame one and re-simulate, now we've got our sparks with these little connected lines uh, out doing their thing. So that's good. That's, that's giving us what we want. Now uh, when you do this, um, it's, you can sort of see some separation between the simulation and the, um, and the piece. And one of the things we can do with the pop net um, is we can, uh, oh right, we're going to put some collision geometry in just because it's going below the ground. So we're going to bring back that collision. This time we don't mind if it bounces, so we don't need the collision detect. We can just use the uh, bouncing of that. So that creates nice jagged sort of bouncing off there. Now if we go back up to the pop net, we want to only see the particles. So we're going to go pop with a star so it gets rid of that collision geometry. Uh, and then we go there. And then we can also uh, play around with the sub-steps. So if we want to tighten up the simulation and how it works, we can increase the number of sub-steps, and that can give us uh, a good result there as well. So oh, I guess we're not going to do that. Uh, OK, so there's our particle thing there. So we got, I mean, this is probably good enough and would, would sort of do what we want. Oh, there we go. That's, that's what I thought. I'm going to up 
up, up the uh, sub steps. And it's subtle, but it does give more intermediate steps and gives a slightly more coherent result. So it's good to, to up those sub steps. You can actually save that till later when you want to output because it does slow things down a little bit, but sub steps are helpful when working with some of this stuff. Uh, especially if you were trying to create something that was, if you wanted your particles to have an arc, um, then you would need to have the sub step so that it would pick up all those intermediate pieces uh, as it would go along. So now that we have this, it's a good starting point, um, but we'd like to have a little bit more variety. We want to have some particles that just go a little bit crazier than the other ones. So to do that, we're going to create some rogue particles. And we're going to do that using a pop group node. Now what this node will allow us to do is take some of the particles that we originally create, so we're going to take that initial uh, group of, of stream particles, and we're going to put them into a group called rogue. So these are our rogue particles. And we're going to randomly select them. So we're going to say, give us a chance of 0.3. So three out of every 10 particles are going to go do their own thing. They're going to go into this group, and then we can manipulate them separately uh, from the main group of particles. And what we can do is we can create a pop color node here for that. We're going to make that red. And we're going to just wiggle that out and put that over here. And we're going to say, in this case, apply that to the rogue particles. So now what you can do is if you get in close and you can see, some of the particles are coming out yellow and the rogues are coming out red. And this is, these color nodes are just helping me figure out what's going on, make sure that it's actually doing what I want it to do, and that helps me sort of debug the system. We'll get rid of the colors sort of at the end. But Now, once we have that, what we want to do is put a pop force in, and we want to take these particles and enhance their velocity so they, they, they go a little crazier than the, uh, the initial particles that we, we had the initial velocity set on. So let's take the rogue ones, and we're going to change the force on there and we're going to add some, you know, a little bit more value in there. Let's go 3, 6, uh, 2. And we're going to use an expression that says uh, take the force and apply it to the velocity. So we're going to take whatever velocity we already have and we're going to enhance that using this force to go a little bit crazier. And that can be done with a simple expression here. So now we go in and uh, you can sort of see it there, but it's a little hard to see. So we're going to go back up to this level where we can see those rogue particles doing their thing. And you know they're, they're a little bit crazy, but it's a little hard to tell the difference between one and the other. Um, so what we can do is if we go dive back in, uh, we can, um, OK, so no, let's go back up here. We're going to pin this so that we can, in the viewport, we can watch the particles with the AdSop, but we can go down into the dot network over here. You can always pin. Uh, one of the views so it doesn't uh, do that. And we, now we've changed it to 12, which makes them a little crazier. Maybe we go a little bit crazier even still and go 30. And now we can go in and now we've got, yeah, okay, now we definitely see the rogue particles doing their thing and they're working independently of the other ones. Uh, and maybe go down to 15 now that we know for sure they're working. So this is a way that we've been able to take one particle stream and branch it off so we can do some things with some of the particles and other things with other particles. And that's, that's really a nice way of working. Now, to help, uh, you know, good practice when you're working in Houdini is to sort of use your network to communicate some of these things to other people in case you're sharing your network with them. So one of the things we're going to do is we're going to take those networks contributing to the yellow particles and we'll make those nodes yellow and we'll make the other particles uh, red. So you can see that we've got um, which, which particles are doing which. And this is a, a helpful way to read, read the, 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 the network. Uh, you can also put in sticky notes and also put notes on your, on, your, on your individual nodes. And that can be another way you can help people communicate to people what's going on. And as a matter of fact, a lot of the sample files that ship with Houdini have a lot of those nodes and networks and, and uh, little, little notes going on in there. So the next step we're going to do is we want to add little sparklers at the end of the rogue particles. So we want the rogue particles to get to the end and, and burst with a little, little, little sparkler. So we're going to go in and we're going to do another pop replicate, and uh, or no, create another group. And this group is going to be built out of the dead particles. So when the rogue particles die, we're going to use that as a starting point for a pop replicate. So we're going to go in and say, give us anything that becomes dead. So in group equals 
I at dead. So there's a hidden attribute in the, the thing called dead. So when a particle goes dead, we throw it in this group. Once we've got it in there, now we can put a pop replicate. So this will take that one particle and replicate it into more. And this one, well, we'll uh, let's tie that specifically to the, um, to the dead group. So only the dead particles are going to do this. And we can go from there. So let's take the dead particles. And now we've got to do a bunch of little parameters, things to, to, to get that to actually do what we want. So we're going to go in and um, set the impulse count to about eight. So we want about eight of these to come out at the same time. Uh, we want to uh, set the values, uh, how many, we just want one, eight of them just to come out. Uh, we're going to call them just born sparklers, so they create a different stream that we can follow, uh, separate from the original spark stream, so that way we can apply uh, things to it, and we'll go from there. And we give it a very, very, very short lifespan because the, these ones aren't that important. Uh, we're going to set the initial, or add to the velocity, just to, so they, they can go a little bit crazier and, and out there, and we set some values here. And of course, you can tinker with these values to get the look that you want um, as you go. Now, after we've got that, what we want to do is we want to go back and we need to get that uh, pop rango we had before. So we can do that parent ID. So we want to make sure that we're copying the parent ID when we, we do the replicating. Uh, so we're going to put that node back in, but we're going to, instead of going to just born, we're going to go to the just born sparklers. So we're picking up that second stream and we're going to work with that instead. Uh, and then after that, we're going to put another pop replicate that's going to create the trail for the sparklers. So this is just repeating sort of what we already had, uh, and that will allow us to get these little, little sparks to look at, to come out from the end there. And notice as I'm doing that, I'm coloring these nodes red because they're only being applied to the rogue particles. So again, it helps with my readability of the network. So just born sparklers. And now we're going to set similar parameters to what I had before. I probably could have copied my pop replicate from over there, bring it over and, and do it. Uh, but I thought it didn't hurt to, uh, to just see this being set up again. So particle count one, zero, zero. Uh, again, give it exactly the same life expectancy and variance as um, the particles being emitted. And then uh, we'll say not, no jitter. And... There we go, and then we're going to set this to points, and we're going to set that to the attributes. Because these are for the trail, uh, we're just going to set their value in 0, 0, 0. So we're just the points come out and do what they have to do. And then we can see whether this has been, we pulled this off. So let's, let's go and, and try this out. And we're going, oh, we should name these this properly, uh, and we'll call this um, trail sparklers. Okay, and uh, now that we have that set, let's play. And, oh, it's doing something a little crazy. And the reason for that is the original pop replicate that I created, this one, uh, I forgot to set that to work off of a point. So it's trying to work off of a sphere out here instead of a point sitting right in there. So because of that, we now get it, and boom, there we go. And what you can see is that now we're getting these little sparklers coming out from the ends of the original particles, and that's giving us the sort of the particle look that we want um, for the fuse as it goes, goes forward. So out of this, I hope what you've learned is how to, to work with some of the parameters on the particles, how to get the particles up to the geometry level, set up some, some attributes on it so that we can use the ADSOP to connect them together, how to branch off and create uh, a little side network to go do special things with those particles and then bring them back together. Uh, once we have that, we can go uh, and let's go back up to the object level uh, and um, maybe just color them all the same. So there we go. And you can see there's that that's working there. If we go back to the, um, oh, I know, we're going to tie, yeah, we're going to bring this down to a, a more reasonable number because that was, uh, that number was a little high. So now we're getting the little sparklers 
uh, but they're, they're a little more subtle in terms of how they do that. So a lot of tweaking. Again, this is the benefit of the procedural workflow is you're constantly going back, tweaking values, letting it feed through the system and getting the result that you want. And then we'll make them all yellow so they look like one coherent system and we'll go from there. Now, of course, setting this up for rendering, that's a different issue. Uh, I'm not going to be discussing that here today, uh, but certainly when the lesson gets published later, we will apply materials and, and get this up. And one of the things that's neat about these particles is we can set them up as a geometry light. So this geometry can actually emit light and create sort of a light the scene around it as it goes. So that'll be fun. But uh, I'm, not, I'm not setting that up here today. Okay, so we've done all our particle work. Now we want to uh, shatter this RBD. And to some degree, this is fairly straightforward. It's not that different than what we did with the soccer ball. Uh, but because we're dealing with a fractured object, there are a couple different things about it. The other thing is, because it's not happening until much later in the, in the sequence, um, we're going to create a dynamic network that doesn't even kick into gear until frame 195. So we'll talk about that. So here we have the bomb, and as you can see, the bomb um, around frame 195 switches um, using that switch stop that we had before. Uh, so that's good, but what, what we're going to do is we're going to set the range from 190 forward just so we can focus on that point of transition. What we're then going to do is dive down here and set the display node on here, because we we're not worried about the original geometry at the moment. Let's get the simulation doing its thing, and then we'll uh, rewire things in a minute. So now that we have that, we can set up that as an RBD fractured object. Now, normally people would put glue on this so that at a, it's held together in a certain point, it breaks apart. But you know what, we know exactly the moment this thing is going to explode, so we don't need to put that extra effort in. What we're going to do instead is uh, we're going to create a new DOP network. Notice how we set the start frame to 195, and we called it Bomb RBD. And then you'll notice at the very bottom, there's a little menu. And if we set that menu, to bomb RBD, any shelf tools we use will go into that DOP network instead of one of the other ones. So that's how you have your own DOP networks and set your own DOP network so I can make sure stuff goes in it. So now we're set up a fractured object. It's going to set it up as a packed object and it's going to put it into that dynamic network. Now notice that because we said don't even start until 195, there's nothing until 195 and then boom, there it is. Now there's no forces or anything on it, so it's not really doing anything. So we can go back in and say, let's add a gravity force. And now you see in the bomb RBD dot, uh, it go, goes in and it's, um, well, it just falls into nothingness. So again, we need to bring in some collision geometry. So we need to go to this point here, um, go in and create a ground plane again. Uh, this one, again, we turn this off. We could have reused the ground plane from before, but just it's easier just to make another one for now. Uh, and we go in and press play, and there we go, and it smashes to the ground. So that's good. That's sort of what we want. I mean, it was not what we want in the end, but it, it shows that everything we've set up so far is doing it. 195, this thing falls and does what it's supposed to do. What we want to do now, though, is we don't want it to fall. We want it to just explode. So we're going to put another force into here, other than gravity, uh, and we're going to do that by putting a meta ball into the scene and putting that meta ball at exactly the position sort of centered on the, on the, um, on, on the, uh, the bomb. Now we're gonna hide it for the moment. Uh, first we gotta find it and just bring it over. So there's our meta ball object and we're gonna hide it for the moment just to help for, for selection purposes and we'll bring it back in a second. We're gonna go down into this uh, dynamic network. We're gonna take that and we're going to say, give us a magnet force and uh, then we're going to go pick the meta ball, select that, and press enter. And now down at the DOP network, if we press L to reorganize our network here, just to clean that up, you'll see that we have a magnet force. Now we're going to set the value, instead of pulling things, we're going to go negative 1,000, just like boom, um, and we'll get rid of that. Uh, we can turn off the guide geometry there, uh, and we can go back up to the object level and turn off the meta ball so we don't see that anymore either. So now that we've got that magnet force in place, we go in and smash. There we go. We just blew that, blew that away. Because it's just one quick motion. We didn't need any glue. We didn't need anything fancy. Now, we're getting a few stray objects here. Now, we could try to change the position of our force to get rid of them or whatever. But you know what? They're at the bottom. Nobody's going to see them. I'm just going to go into here. I'm going to select those two things. And I'm going to put a visibility swap down and just hide them. Um, so they're, not, they're, they're still there, 
they're still part of the geometry, but we're never going to have to see them again. We wire that into this switch node, and now we can play this back, and there we, there we go. And those pieces, they just disappeared, and we didn't, didn't know that they ever existed. So that's, that's helpful. And there we go. So now we've got our, our bomb here. We can turn on um, some of our ele other elements. We go back to frame one. Here we can see the sparks with the soot trail all feeding in and blowing up the bomb. So the three of our elements down, uh, what we want to do now is um, work on the pyro sim. Now, like I said before, the pyro part is probably the least fleshed out of what I've done so far. Uh, so because of that, you'll have to forgive me, it's going to be worked on and when the, the, the foundation tutorial comes out, there'll be a much better job of, of introducing that. But I think just to show you, just at general, how do we uh, tackle this, uh, the fireball side of things, um, we'll just quickly go through some of the steps to do it. We're going to use one of the shelf tools, which is an explosion shelf tool, and because of that, it's, um, you know, it's going to be fairly easy to set up, uh, but we don't have it set up looking all beautiful yet. Um, That'll, we'll have to do a little bit more work on it there. So again, we create a new dot net. So this idea of having multiple dot nets, and this one um, we will uh, use as a source this torus. So we're going to put a torus, and we're going to put it right up in the middle of the bomb here. Instead of putting it off of a sphere, a torus might give us a little bit of, of, of interest there. And then we're going to put in another dot net, and we're going to call this bomb pyro. And then we're going to use that menu in the bottom corner again. And by setting that to, um, to this new dot net, anything we do on the shelf will go into that new one instead of, instead of an auto dot net or something like that. And don't forget to do that step in the m middle there, or else you'll start getting dynamic stuff inside your pop net or somewhere else. And that's, that would have made things a little bit, little bit messy. So you got to make sure if you're going to use these different dot nets that you're pointing that, that menu down below to point that into there. And again, we start frame at 195. We're going to take that, and we're simply going to go in and take pyro effects, explosion, and boom, the shelf tool sort of sets it all up for us. Now, the only thing is we press play, and it's like the explosion. It's not exploding. It's like it's already there. And the reason for that is there's an animated component to this uh, that's on side this, on this source volume. And if we look at the channel for that, uh, we see that the actual explosion is, is way up here, uh, which is at frame one. So we need to take that and we need to move that over to frame 195 so it's, it's more positioned better the way that we, uh, that we want our explosion to go. And uh, again, there's probably a lot more tweaking we could do on this to get it to look uh, perfect, but just want to give you the basic principles here, uh, here today. And once we've got that working, we can hide that, and now we go, and now you see there's a little bit more of an actual explosion that happens right there at that. But it's, it's a little wimpy um, uh, because of the size and scale and so on, so we, we, we would want to play with some other parameters to do that. Um, if we go back to the animation camera, uh, we can see it sort of happening there, because that's where we'd wa probably want to judge it, uh, is it doing what we want it to do. We can bring back some of the geometry and just... Uh, Take that pyrosim, and we can just see: is it do? Is it got the size and scale that we need? Ooh, it's yeah, that's not what we need. So we'd have to put a little more work into the timing and getting that uh, doing what we want. So one way is just to take that initial explosion uh, and and raise that value up to like 10, and then um, you know we'll already start to see a benefit of that. Um, as now the explosion is going to be a little bigger. So just like anything in the simulation environment, it's just playing with the forces and the, the velocities and the things that feed into it. And then from there, uh, you can get a little bit more of what you want. So anyway, we won't dwell too much on this. Uh, sorry. Uh, we'll, uh, you know, I think we, I think I'd just go in and try to change the value even higher just to see if we can push it. Uh, but now we're starting to see, yes, that's a little bit better. Uh, but we need it to be faster, we need it to, to react better, so there's other things that we're going to have to tinker with to get that to work. 
Well, I hope I've been able to help you with some of the ideas and concepts in here, uh, but if you want to go further with your learning uh, and look at other parts of Houdini, uh, we have a great section on Houdini called Getting Started, and it's in our Learning Pass section, so sideeffects.com slash learn. Not only will you find the foundation book, uh, you'll find a bunch of learning paths for games, VFX, character, and so on. Um, and uh, for instance, you can get access to the Applied Houdini. There's a whole series. Um, Steve Nipping from ILM uh, has a great set of tutorials that a lot of people uh, find very useful to get started. Rebelway is another place you could go and take one of their courses. And we actually have a whole bunch of t tutorials that have been submitted by members of the community. And we try to consolidate them all up on the website. So anything you need uh, is searchable and available uh, through that source. So. I um, encourage you to go and try that out. And like I said, the foundation book, you can either download the PDF or print on demand if you'd like a hard copy of it. Well, thank you very much. I hope. <laughs> um, I think uh, we have a bit of a Q&A now, if anyone has any questions from all that. Um, yes. Oh, we only have three minutes? OK, so we have time for a couple questions. I'm going to be in the room next door if you'd like to come to me and ask questions there as well. So uh, we don't have to do it here if, uh, yes. When you set up the uh, parent ID yeah. on some of the particle systems, is that essentially creating particle groups? Uh, yeah, well, it, IDs, when, I, when I did the ADSOP, I said use the attributes on there to make the connection. So the parent ID attribute then became the thing that I used to say only connect those, only add those ones together. So, yeah. A lot of Houdini is about these attributes and just getting them to do what you want, put them in the right place and get them to flow through the system and so on, like that. Yeah. Okay, well, have a great day at the show. Thanks for joining us here today. <laughs>